Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name is Santiago. Thank you for being here. Um, first of all, I want to say, excuse, uh, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed that I cannot speak Portuguese. I mean, we are so close. We are neighbor, neighbor countries, and I cannot speak Portuguese. It's kind of crap. So sorry about that. Um, I'm the co-founder of Remoter.com. Uh, we basically teach programming, uh, but I also have to um, work to pay the bills, so I am also work as a consultant. Um, first things first, this talk, I, I kind of shape it based on the audience. I was told today that it was more like a beginner audience, um, so we can move to more advanced things if you want. This is always a talk that gives something to speak about, so please, if you have any questions, any comments, you can just interrupt me and let's make it a conversation more than just to talk, all right? Um, so working as a consultant, working as a programmer by day and teaching people by night is pretty cool because you get to work with other programmers and you also get to teach them uh, about programming, right? And you can identify things that are good to teach, you can identify things that are hard for them to understand and you can shape the way you teach uh, based on that. I'm also kind of a freak uh, about education. I, I put so much effort into doing it well, into studying it. Uh, so I, I, for the last couple of years, I've been trying to identify things that make uh, what I want to tell, what I want to say is a good programmer, right? And of course, this is an, a subjective opinion. Uh, this is just an opinion. You might have different ideas about it. Um, so we're all free to just share. So with all these years, I've been trying to identify these traits that make a good programmer, and I have um, type, like, give importance to, to the things that are what identify a really good programmer, right? Because we can have different things that will uh, configure us as programmers, but on the end, there will be some that will be more important than others, right? So in this quest, I have came to, to, to build this scheme uh, which is a pyramid of the good programmer. And it's a really simple pyramid. Uh, every pyramid, the base, it, this is the most, the most important thing. You can read from bottom to top. Um, and it has some different concepts that I will be speaking about. So the idea will be that I will get a frame from this pyramid and I'm going to get some contents from there, some concepts, and, and we, we can talk about them. For every one of these frames, I have different concepts. So I have tried to shrink it uh, to just the ones that I thought were more important for, for the audience, but there are so many things to talk about, right? So let's get started. The first one is what I call personal development, discipline, and introspection. Um, this is the most important one. It's just, it's also a special one because it's not just something that uh, deals with programmers, but also as, uh, with us as people, right? It's like, this is the frame that you could, you could strip out all the other frames. You could just, just leave this one. And having a, a well-thought personal development, discipline, and introspection, you could build the pyramid back. Every, if everything disappears, this is what needs to remain. Of course, you're going to build your own pyramid. There will be things for you that are more important than others. But at the end, you will build something that will be your pyramid of things that are more important to, to develop and to learn, right? Um, the first concept in this frame uh, is relates to introspection. It's not introspection in code. Introspection as a person, right? Sitting and thinking, what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? What things I need to improve, right? These things are really important. And the other special characteristic about this concept is that it just, it just doesn't deal with with uh, programmers, it also deals with people. This is the thing that is going to tell you that you can be a better programmer, but it's also going to tell you that you can be a better friend, or a better father, or a better citizen, or a better person in general, right? It's those things that you need to work with. You need to sit from time to time and think what things you can improve. There are different techniques, there are different things. I invite you guys to, if you have ideas, for example, I meditate, I set times in my calendar to just sit alone in a quiet space and just think, a 
about things that I'm fucking up or things that I need to improve. So there are different things and we can talk about it. Um, the, the other important concept is that the good programmer learns. Uh, we're all nerds, right? Uh, we all like to learn and that's something really, really important. Even though, again, this frame, the personal development frame, is for all people in general, this applies a lot to programmers. There is this quote that says, programmers take vacation to program, right? It's like we have a week off and then you just go to sit and code in, in our own project or something or work in this new technology. It's like we are, we are nerds and that's what we do. So never stop learning, keep learning. The way that I, I like to say that I feel like I'm a good programmer today is because I look back one year and I see what I used to do at that time. I see my code at that time and I say, why did I do this? I mean, I was, why, why? I see it back and I see this is wrong. And probably one year from now, I'm going to look back today and I'm going to say the same thing. And that's something good. You should look back and you should say, okay, I learned something, right? We, the, the idea is that we should, you should think about yourself as you know nothing and just keep looking how to improve and how to learn. The other frame, the next one, is a communication and social skills. I think I don't have to add much uh, to this frame. It's pretty obvious that we need to communicate as people. And as programmers, we get to deal with different types of people which all are different to deal with. Programmer first. We are difficult people to deal with, right? We have our own thoughts. Uh, there, there is no way I'm going to change Emacs. There is no way I'm going to change GitHub, right? It's like we have our own things that we care and it's hard to communicate between us. Uh, there, but there, there is also managers which they are going to push you. There are clients, there are users, there are customers. So there is this big space of people that we need to communicate with and it's really, really important that we focus on how to improve it. Um, so one concept that I always say it's important is that participating in open source communities, it's a great boost. Just by doing that, you're going to get a really, really good grasp on, on the basic communication skills that you need, right? And I always tell this story, uh, you know guys, the RFC, request for comments, for example, when you have HTTP, it's uh, specified, the protocol is specified in an RFC. It's a document. Uh, the RFC was built by this guy, Steve Crocker, and he was working on the ARPANET. Um, they were a bunch of kids from a college in California. At that time, they were hippies from California, and they had the task to build the ARPANET. The ARPANET could become internet after that. So it was re this really complicated and advanced network that could communicate military facilities government, universities, all across the United States, right? It was a huge deal. And in charge of that were these kids from college, right? From California college, they were hippies. So they, was always, they were always thinking, how can we propose these radical ideas without being, uh, I don't know, tear, up, tear apart by government people or by military people or by all professors from, from, from colleges? So what they did was, Instead of saying, let's do this, or we propose this protocol, let's do something different. Let's say that we are working on this protocol, that we think it's all right, and let's ask for comments for people. So let's request for comments. So it's a way to not sound like a dick, right? It's like, I'm working on this, what do you think about? And that's how re requests for comments were built, and that's how they, were able to put their crazy ideas into ARPANET when nobody thought it was going to be something at the time, right? So what they did, they identified the, the, the type of people they need to talk to, how they could communicate, how would they, would they react, and they put in place the right way to communicate, right? So this is a really, really important topic and it's something that we usually fail as developers. Uh, the other thing that a good programmer does is listens, right? It's like you can have two types of persons, of people, sorry. You can say to someone something maybe challenging and one type of people is going to tell you no. 
the first thing they're going to say is no, that's wrong. The other type of people is going to sit and say, hmm, interesting, tell me more, why? Maybe he or she doesn't agree with you. Maybe she thinks you're crazy, but she's going to tell you, wh why, what do you think that? I mean, I have a person in front of me uh, that seems healthy enough. Maybe he has a point, so I'm going to listen to him. So that's something really, really important and something we have to cultivate as, as programmers, right? Listening to people. Before pushing our ideas, start listening more, right? Um, a, a good exercise is after I talk to someone, I should be able to put back in paper what she or he told me without distortioning it, because we also try to distortion it. So something else you can work with if you feel that you are not listening enough is try to do that. You talk to someone and then try to put what she or he told you in paper. Um, the next frame is related to math, not in terms of math like differential equations, but more abstractions and patterns. Um, it's something that's it's so, so simple. When I start teaching uh, beginner people, they think they know it, but it's something that even seasonal programmers don't know, right? Working with good abstractions. And that's the next concept. Um, the good programmer is going to abstract things for you. It's going to make things easier for you, right? And not just in coding, in general, right? Think about a car. Think when you get into a car. How do you turn it on? You just put a key and you twist it and it starts, right? It's like this really simple process. You should sit, put a key, twist, engine starts. Input, key, twist, output, engine starts. There is a freaking engine in there. It's so complex, but yet the abstraction makes it so simple for us. So that's the type of abstraction that we need to work as programmer, right? We need to give maybe a complex piece of code to someone and that person shouldn't fear or shouldn't feel the hassle of working with it, right? Working with clear abstractions and providing clear interfaces. Um, these frames, the, the, the next three frames are more related to technical things. There are so many things to put in here. Uh, I have chosen just a few of them to, to, to discuss with you, but there are so many different things to to talk about. So the first one is related to technical concepts, basic technical concepts in general, uh, that are not yet related entirely to programming, right? The first one is networking hardware and operating systems. Seems stupid, but there are people, there are programmers that after five years working, they still don't know the base abstraction of, of these things. Of course, you shouldn't be, I, I mean, it's hard that every programmer is going to know how to I don't know how entirely a CPU works, but at least you need to have some knowledge of how you can interact with it, right? So, for example, I, I, this is a wild guess, but I think that 90% of this room in this entire conference are going to work with web, right? Pretty much all of us do web development. Even if you are doing mobile development, for example, you're using REST interfaces or you're, doing, you're dealing with networking and HTTP. And yet, if I ask you how many of you, or to other people experience, how many of you have read the RFC of HTTP 2616? No, pretty much no one read it, right? And, and it's the base, how does it work? And yet, it always happens that people start mixing concepts which makes, at the end, the, program, the problems that we have with, um, with, with code. After that, we also have operating system, which is important because uh, this is controversial, of course. Someone might have a different opinion. I think, I believe, I do this in our courses. We pretty much put people to work in a Unix environment, e either Linux or Mac. And even if you can work with Python on Windows entirely, we think that you need to know at least some instructions of Linux or Unix-like operating system, and that's really, really, really important. Because at the end, some server at some point in your life is going to be working with a Linux environment. Um, the good programmer also knows about data. 
Usually, we as programmers love to talk about behavior. I read this use case. This is how it works. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to build that. I'm going to use this package and that library. But pretty much, the data is always forgotten. Data is the, all, the last thing we, we, we think about. I'm going to build this complex flow, but I'm just going to use a list. So you spend three hours designing your algorithms, but you spend one second deciding your data structure, right? Um, data is really, really important inside your programs and also outside your programs, right? Where are you going to store your data? Are you going to cache it? How are you going to secure it? Where are you going to access it? Have you thought about lat latency? So all these things are really, really important. And here I have a quote for, from the creator of um, Linux, Linus Torvalds. Uh, bad programmers worry about the code Good programmers worry about data structures and their, and their relationships, right? So it's really important for us as programmers to start thinking what data I'm using, how I am, am I using it, and, and how can I get put it in a better way, right? Data is really, really important. Actually, when Linus says this, he's talking about Git, uh, which is a really complex system, right? And he says that Git is a pretty simple code base but they have built the right data structure for it. They have these special trees and hashes and all that, and says, we put all the load of a complex system in really clear and abstracted data structures. Finally, we, well, not finally, but really close to the end, we have uh, what I call programming foundations. These are also bases, right? Basic things that you need to know, but they are related, but they can be applied to any programming language. It's something that you can, it's some concept that you can apply to game development, that you can apply to web development, that you can apply to whatever, you can use these concepts. And this part here is loaded. I have just chosen, I think, three or four, but there are so many things that we can talk about. Uh, the, fir the first concept is that the good programmer knows about different paradigms. And this, this is really, really important. We start, we're, we're starting to get it more technical. If you're starting to program, start learning more paradigms. Not just object-oriented programming, not just uh, imperative programming. Start trying to, to learn about uh, logical programming, functional programming, aspects, uh, prototypes, everything you can learn. Because even if you keep using the paradigm that you have chosen before, the, 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 the concepts that you get from other paradigms are going to enrich um, your development during the time, right? It's really, really important. For example, I was working with Python full time and I started learning Scala, this uh, language that is from, from Java, it was like five, six years ago. And I, I thought I knew about functional programming, but I didn't, right? Because I thought I had some knowledge from it from the college, but then when I started to work with it, it improved my Python skills so much just by learning some functional programming skills. Um, other important concept is the, group, the good programming know, the good programmer, sorry, know, knows how to name things correctly. This is something that pretty much no one pays attention, but names are really, really important. We name everything. Functions, method, classes, packages, modules, projects, directories, configuration files, we name everything. Right? And yet, we don't pay much attention to that. So please take the time to name your things right. Take the times. It's hard. Sometimes you're in this crazy um, fury code session. You're typing and typing and typing. You just want to put P, Q, I, J. But take the time to put good names, right? It's going to pay after that. I have a couple of examples here that things that I always see. By the way, I work with people that has been coding for 10 years and I still see these things, right? For example, the, the most basic example, just a, a letter. Don't do this, please. <laughs> Don't do this. If, if the, the, the rule of thumb is that if you think that you need to comment something based on the name or what you're storing, you're doing naming wrong, right? Names should never have a comment attached. If it has a comment attached, 
it's either too complex, you have to split it, or you are not using the right name. So the small improvement here is to do price, right? Uh, and this is something that nobody does, but of course I put dollars there, because it's like we're working and we just do, oh, car price. And we always forget the units, right? So that's something really important. When you name your things, be take special attention into naming your things with the units that you're using, right? So you are putting weight, weighting what, right? And, and try to think about granularity. Should I use cents here? Can I use dollars? Um, can I use uh, an, a, an abstract type that I want? Think about it. Put some thought in it, into it. Of course, a good, a good example would be to put everything in your name. It's verbose, but it's self documented and it's pretty. Um, the good programmer also knows about data types. This seems silly. Data types are like the basic things you start with, right? It's like you open your IPython or your, uh, the tutorial from Python or something and they say uh, fire shell do x equal one, you have an integer, x plus two, something like that. That's like the basic type, right? Then you do print something and it's like data types are so simple, right? They are strings, numbers, dates, but when you start working with them in deep, they are so, so, so complex things to deal with. For example, dates. I tell you, store the purchase date. And you'll say, okay, I'm going to, stay, to store, I don't know, a daytime object, a timestamp. And if, you, if you're just starting, you just say, I'm going to, start to store a daytime. But it, then you are I, the questions are going to start creeping out. Like, for example, did you store it in UTC? Or what is that? That's the time zone associated with, um, with the time zone. Uh, wait, there, but you have to show it to your user, yes. Your user is on New York, yes. You have to do the conversion, yes. But does he have uh, daylight saving times? I don't know. Well, you should figure that out too. So what happens with leap years? We're losing seconds, we're losing, we're adding days. What happened with that? So data types, are really, really complex things that these guys have done a really good job and they are abstracting that complexity to us, but they are really, really hard things to deal with. What I like to say is that data types are the most complex things to deal with. In programming, they are the most challenging things to deal with. If you have ever built a web service that needs to talk with, for example, East Europe with their weird encoding characters, you know what I'm talking about. You know, getting a request from I don't know, uh, Poland or something with these weird characters and you have to parse it inside your, your service. Data types are really hard and as a programmer that wants to improve, think about them, try to learn about them, trying to improve how you deal with them. Um, the good programmer crushes things, crushes things and loves it. We need to love things when they crush. We need to let things crush loudly. Right? If there is fire, if there is screaming, that's better. Don't hide things. Let things crash. When you are developing and there is an error, it shouldn't be error online thing. There should be a huge error saying, you did this really, really wrong. I can this cannot be tolerated. There should be a big, big crash that it's really, really loud. All right? It's going to be, be at first it seems it's like we fear that because we say we cannot show all this to our user. Of course, you're not going to show it to your user, you're going to show it to yourself. But we don't like it. I mean, it's like we have built this code and now it's crashing so loudly, it's so awful. But let's do it. Start making your things crash. Don't silent things, all right? Start, stop catching exceptions. We like to do put an accept with a pass something. Stop doing that. Make things crash. Um, and finally, I have the tip of the pyramid, uh, which is related just to programming languages. And I put this here on purpose because this is the least important thing you can think about. It's like we as programmers love to talk about technical things. We love to talk about uh, I'm using this Node.js package for this thing, or I'm going to use Redis for that other thing. But the truth is that that's not really important. If you have been coding for more than six, seven years, you have seen 
so many te technologies going up and down, going up and down, going up and down, that it's, it doesn't matter. You know, you have to cultivate the things that are below that. Uh, if you start working today with JavaScript and you're a good developer, you will have no issues at all because we have different things. We know that we need to understand uh, prototyping. We need to understand that uh, V8 is this crazy compiler that is really fast because some things that are related to technical things. And we need to know that prototyping it's uh, um, a paradigm that works in this way. And after all the things, just grabbing JavaScript is really, really simple, right? So programming languages, it's good to work with them with as much as you can, but not because of the language itself, but because the, param the, param the paradigm sorry, they expose or the community they expose or the, or the ideas they expose, right? So Python, we know that has this really good um, community and practices they're good practices, right? You cannot put ugly code. So that's something good. Working with Python is going to give you good things, but are not related to Python, are related to good practices and good paradigms that, that these languages choose. So I have come to the end. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry again for speaking in English. Uh, I will try to make it in Portuguese the next time. And this is, this is totally open. We can just start talking, questions, suggestions, techniques they use to improve it, either thing. Uh, hi, uh, I like to, I, I want to congratulate you about your presentation. It's very, really, really nice presentation about a good programmer. I only miss uh, something more about uh, process in between uh, uh, that, that, that Connect the dots about everything you, you, you are talking about the layers in process. Uh, sometimes they are or orthogonal, and you use all that skills that uh, on the parliament, and talk more about how these these things connect it to each other. Well, the, I think it's easier usually to start from top to bottom. In this case, when you're trying to connect things. Working from here to the past is easier to connect from the past to the future. It's like you're sitting here and you see what you did, but if you were two years ago, it's hard to see how it was going to progress, right? So in that case, it's easier to start with a language. So for example, I'm working with Python and I am naming something wrong. So I go down one level, right? So how are you going to, go to know about that? Because you were working with Python and you have this really cool community and this community, they will, for example, sending pull requests is a good practice that uh, Python always have, Python projects or Python people always have that type of, of, of I don't know, the, um, costumes, right? So they are going to ask you to send a pull request. When you send a pull request, where in the language level, they're going to tell you what is P. And you're going to say it's price in dollars. So they're going to tell you, put price in dollars, right? And when you go down, you will start saying, thinking, for example, you're going to jump straight down and say, why did I know that? And you are going to start thinking, how can I improve these things? I mean, I know a lot about Python. I know that about async IO. I know about the gill. I know everything technical. But I didn't know that I had to use the right name. What am I failing? And then you're going to grab, for example, uh, a good book like Clean Code or The Pragmatic Programmer or Code, or Code Complete, one of those books. So it's this process that you usually start from the, st from the tip and then you go, you go down. Any other questions, comments? Some, somebody wants to share something?
So the question is, how, what tip would you give to, and this is open, if someone else has anything, please do it. Uh, what tip would you give to someone that starts, right? And since like, sees like this challenging process that he or she will never go through. Um, something that I will tell my students is that try to complete the process of whatever you are doing. Don't get so stressed. So what, there are two types of students or people or process that you can follow to do something. For example, you are trying to build a simple web page. You can start and you would say, um, okay, you could go like in a breath first, right? In, like in a three, you go, I'm going to just pick whatever web server I can. I'm going to pick the first function I see in the tutorial. I'm going to pick the first HTML thing I can get. No CSS, no CSS, I'm just going to spit some HTML. That's one way. You went through all the process, you spit something out. Of course, you know nothing in the details, right? The other way is you start and you say, oh, I'm going to take some time to decide what web server to use. And you stay, you, you spend two hours deciding if it's Flask, if it's either Python, if it's whatever. You go to the next step and you say, okay, I'm going to get a request. What char set is that request? What type of char set they are using it? What content type is it? You, you make all these questions. And then you go, for each of these things, you start going deep, right? So that's something I usually don't think it's a good idea because it's really easy to get stressed out so quickly, right? So the idea is that you should do uh, like the Inception movie. You should go all the way out to when you finish something and then you should start again from the start, right? Like one level deep and say, okay, I'm going to pay more attention to the web server design. And then you're going to try it again and again and again. And every time you're going to put more attention to the things that you have done before, right? So that's usually what I recommend to my students and we, what we do, um, because it's really easy when you're starting to just think that everything is so complicated, you're just so stressed. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you.